Good morning. I want to talk to you about those who question Jesus. Now, first of all, face this fact. There's nothing wrong in asking questions. As we ask questions, we learn, and that's why these little people ask questions. You get a three, four-year-old, and they never stop asking questions. And that's good and that's healthy, although it can drive you absolutely crazy. Now, people came and asked questions from Jesus. But notice there are two things. You can ask an honest, straightforward question, or you can ask a loaded question to trap somebody. And Jesus faced both sorts of questions. I found I've had to do the same thing in ministry. In England, at a Baptist church, when we had a church meeting, the congregation got together, the minister was the chairman. And one man in particular would ask loaded questions. So I went to a man who was very wise in my church and a very powerful brain, and I said, how do I deal with this? And he gave me a classic reply. He said, every question you're ever asked, even when you know it's loaded, just answer it absolutely straightforward and leave it there. And I found his advice was tremendous. Now, what did Jesus do? Well, first of all, we find Nicodemus came to him. We find this in John chapter 3 and verse 4. And Nicodemus said to Jesus, How can a man be born when he's old? Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. Here's a man, I believe, with an honest search, because we find out later on that Nicodemus was a disciple of Jesus. Secretly, it's true, but he was in the Sanhedrin, and we don't know all the ins and outs as to why Nicodemus was keeping his discipleship to himself. We can't judge the man. But certainly he came to Jesus to ask questions. I said to you the other week, he came by night, but don't get upset by that. That was a Jewish practice. They were both busy during the day, so when could they get together? Well, in the evening when they were both free. So one evening he got together with Jesus and asked questions. And Jesus was saying, you must be born again. Nicodemus says, how can I when I'm old? He's thinking in the physical. Jesus is thinking in the spiritual. Let me ask you something. Do you as a Christian think in the spiritual, or do you think in the flesh? Do you think in the carnal? You see, some Christians are always thinking in the flesh. They're not seeing in the spiritual. And this was Nicodemus' own problem. And Jesus had to set him straight. But there's someone else who came to him. This was a rich man. We don't know what age he was, but it says in Luke 18 and verse 18, A certain ruler asked him, Good teacher, was must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, a very simple question. And Jesus comes back with a question, first of all, why do you call me good? No one's good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not give false witness. Honor your father and mother. All these I have kept since I was a boy. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, You still lack one thing. Sell everything you have, give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. He couldn't do it, or wouldn't do it. He wouldn't give up his riches. But the question was very valid. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And I think if Jesus was here today, a number of you would ask him the same thing. How do I get eternal life? And I think he'd say very simply, accept me into your life, believe on me, and change your lifestyle. And some of you would back off and say, I don't want to do that. I want to stay the way I am. And friend, that's entirely your decision. You have free will. You can choose to do what you want to do. The only thing is this, what you choose in this life is going to go with you into eternity. And that's a long time. For eternity goes on and on and on and on and on. And I don't know where you are, but I know where I want to be. I want to be with the Lord my God. And I don't want to be anywhere else. I want to inherit eternal life. And I can only do that in Jesus. Now, the scribes and Pharisees asked Jesus questions on a number of occasions. In Matthew 15 and verse 1 we find... Then some of the Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem and asked, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. Now here's an interesting one. This was a tradition of the elders. It was not a commandment of God. And this is what we call the verbal or oral law. 
the elders, the Jewish elders, they had added to the law of God in that they had given interpretation and interpretations and interpretations. So it's believed that there were as many as 10,000 interpretations of the law of God when Jesus came, which was all right. The problem was that they put their interpretations on a level with God's law. That was wrong. Sometimes they even elevated it above God's law. That was worse because it was sacrilege. And Jesus tried all the time to bring them back to see that it was God's law that mattered. The problem here was that they wanted something done on the outside when they themselves weren't right on the inside. And this is where Jesus came back at them. Why don't your disciples wash their hands, which is an outward thing, and of course it was a ritual for the Jews. He says, and yet you fellows don't have clean hearts. You're filthy on the inside. You do this, you do this, you do this, and you're not clean. Why are you talking about your hands when your hearts are wrong? Their values were completely wrong. Also, I find John the Baptist sent a question to Jesus. Do you remember? He landed in prison. And it says in Matthew 11, verse 2, when John the Baptist heard in prison what Jesus was doing, he sent his disciples to ask him, Are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? Well, you say, why would he ask that? Well, I don't think you've ever sat in Herod's prison. I don't think you've ever felt what John felt. Here was an outdoorsman. Here was a man who spent his days in the wilderness. Suddenly he shut up, locked up, cooped up in a tiny little room. Can you imagine how he felt? Can you imagine how depression attacked him? No wonder he questioned whether Jesus was really the one. It must have been an awful experience for John. And Jesus replies in a very fascinating way. He never gave a direct word to those who asked him. He simply told them to tell John what was going on. The miracles, the teaching, go back and tell John this. And from that, John would deduce exactly who Jesus was. Then the Pharisees and the Herodians asked questions. First of all, I find in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 10, the Pharisees asked. He sa they said to him, in verse 10, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? You see, what they would said in these interpretations of the law, if you heal on the Sabbath day, you're working, and if you're working, you're breaking the law of God. Listen to what Jesus said. If any of you has a sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will you not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable is a man than a sheep? Therefore it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. So he stretched it out, and it was completely restored, just as sound as the other. Here was a man with a physical problem, and all they wanted to do was trap Jesus about the law, and not even the law of God. It was the traditions that they had added to it. Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? Well, obviously, if someone's sick, you heal them. On God's day, and the Lord rejoices, but you see, these men were so gummed up in their rules and regulations, they couldn't even rejoice over teaching. They couldn't even rejoice over healing. They couldn't rejoice over anything. They were gummed up in the law and the rules. Be careful of that. If you're a Christian who's legalistic, you've moved away from the heart of Jesus, friend. Then the Pharisees, along with the Herodians, came and asked another question. We find this in Matthew chapter 22 and verse 17. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Now, if Jesus said no, they'd have gone straight to the Roman authorities and said he's trying to incite the people. If he said yes, he'd lose favor with the people. Listen to what Jesus said, verse 18. Knowing their evil intent, he said, You hypocrites, you're trying to trap me. Now here was a question that was loaded. Show me the coin you use for paying the taxes. So they brought him a penny. Whose portrait is this and whose inscription, says Jesus. Do you see again, Jesus takes their questions and makes it into a question. And then straight away they had a problem. They said, Caesar's. Then Jesus said, Give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and give to God what is God's. When they heard this, they are amazed. So they left him and went away. Jesus had them absolutely. You give to Uncle Sam what is Uncle Sam's, and you give to God what is God's, and don't let Uncle Sam push in on God's territory. And God won't push in on Uncle Sam's. That's what Jesus said. 
They asked a question, they got a question back. Now, there are a number of questions asked in Matthew 22. In verse 24, we find the Sadducees came on the same day to ask Jesus. And they said to him in verse 24, and this is an interesting little question, Teacher, Moses told us if a man dies without having children, his brother must marry the widow and have children for him. Now, there were seven brothers among us. The first one married and died, and since he had no children, he left his wife to his brothers. Same thing happened to the second, third, right down to the seventh. Finally, the woman died. Now then, at the resurrection, whose wife will she be of the seven, since all of them were married to her? Jesus replied, you're in, in error. You don't understand the scriptures and the power of God. At the resurrection, people will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. Now, I'll guarantee some of you listening to my voice are thrilled that you won't be married in heaven. And some of you feel a sharp pain because your marriage is so beautiful and you don't know how you're going to deal without it. Don't worry. On both sides, you're going to be perfect and it will not concern you. You'll be in a new dimension. But you see, they were thinking in the physical and not in the spiritual. And then they sent a teacher, an expert in the law, to trap Jesus. They'd had enough of him. So in the same chapter, Matthew 22, verse 36, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Now, this fellow had just set Jesus up beautifully. Listen to what Jesus said. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like unto it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Then, of course, he tells the parable of the Good Samaritan. But notice what verse 46 says, the last verse. No one could say a word in reply. From that day on, no one dared to ask Jesus any more questions. He had put his questioners to silence with the wisdom of the Lord his God. Fantastic. Go over some of the questions, some of the questioners. See where they're coming from. Understand their thinking. And see the classic replies Jesus gave. Often he asked them another question. Sometimes he handled them in a different way. But Jesus was the master of the questions every time because he is filled with the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit was controlling him and the answers were Holy Spirit every time.